So what are you going to tell us, tough guy? I said, my usual, zero, nothing. <laughs> Honestly, it feels a little bit strange that I even have to address you right now. The reason for that is because for like the last two and a half months, this podcast has existed just in the unlisted file on my YouTube page, which has currently zero public videos. <laughs> Each week I, I stand in my in my little studio at the back of my house. I've got a microphone set up in front of me. I've got my laptop on a chair on top of a table because I'm all about stand-up desks at the moment, but not committed enough to, to buy one. And... Uh, and I'd sort of just spitball a little bit, just spitball ideas and thoughts and joke premises and um, just whatever else comes to my head. It's amazing how quickly you find out what's going in your head as you start talking. And so often I find out that what's going on in my head might not be uh, completely acceptable based on the look of the people's faces that I'm telling that story to. So, hey, maybe the beauty with this podcast is I can't actually see your face, but if I've offended you, uh, within the first 60 seconds of the podcast, I'd like to apologize. But if you are easily offended, perhaps don't don't tune into this one. No, I'm not trying to offend you. Chances are, if we met, I, I've got a big love for a lot of people. I reckon I probably, there's a good chance me and you would get along. But there's some things that come out of my mouth and people go, yeah, nah, Tice, 2021, maybe not acceptable. So if you are, if you are of the elk, is it elk or ilk? If you are of the ilk, let's just commit with that. Google it, we'll, we'll check it out. Maybe maybe don't tune in because it, it's guaranteed to... I'll, I'll probably be offended. I'll listen back to some of the things that I was saying and I was like, oh my God, that guy's a Muppet. Only to remember it was the, the podcast that I recorded myself, which was, which was causing the offense. So look, here's the thing. The reason I've started this is for, for a variety of reasons. I'm going to do it once a week. I'm going to post it publicly once a week. Even if those of you who are listening now never come back again, and this is a podcast for my ears only... I'm going to do it once a week. Now, the reason for this is, so three years ago, I started doing stand-up comedy, and part of the stand-up comedy world, which I find so fascinating, I find so interesting, and I can't quite grasp how to do it perfectly, which I'm, I'm pretty sure doesn't exist, is how to, how to write comedy. So how to write comedy? How is it that, that good comedians actually prepare their material? And there's so many different ways. If there's any comedians out there listening to this, I know you'll appreciate there are there's seriously infinite ways to, to write jokes. I was listening to a podcast with Kevin Hart and Jerry Seinfeld a few weeks ago, and Jerry Seinfeld said, yeah, I, I store every single journal with every single joke that I've ever written, whether it was public or whether it was private, and I just put that in a chest, and there's all my jokes. And Kevin Hart was like, Jerry, I'm going to be honest with you. I've got dot points in my iPhone that I refer to. And, and I, I love, I love the, uh, like the gap in the spectrum between the two ways that these guys prepared because both greats in the scene, both awesome comedians, completely different way of doing preparation. I thought, man, all right, well, there's different, there's different ways to do it. And while I've been in this experiential phase of... Um, of writing comedy, it made it sound like I was going to say I'm exploring my sexuality. I'm not. Maybe it was just, I, while I'm in this experiential phase of, of trying to figure out where to find material, what I've found is just spitballing, freestyling a little bit about certain subjects on a piece of paper that I've gotten written down is really helpful. Because so often in conversation, I'll say something, someone might laugh, I might laugh, usually it's me who's laughing. I... I go, oh, oh, there's something there. Like that's that's a little bit funny, and a lot of people like they're I think they're attracted to the idea or like this romanticized idea of sitting down behind a computer and just typing. And I like that sometimes, but sometimes I feel like when I'm speaking, my mind operates at obviously a faster pace than my fingers can move when I'm typing. So you can get a bit more of a genuine idea of of what it is that you're trying to explore. So that's why that's what this podcast exists for. I, I'm going to listen back to it and go, all right, is there anything there that's funny? Like, is there anything there that's offensive? Is there anything there that you probably should, shouldn't talk about that, that you really do want to talk about? And is there a way to put that all together so that it, it turns out to be funny? I don't know. We're going we're gonna to go on this journey together. And then, uh, and then some weeks, maybe I'll jump on and, and interview someone that I'm interested in, reach out to a couple of people in all different scenes and just see if they're willing to sit down and, and have a chat. I mean, the podcast world is funny as well. I know full well 
that there is there's absolutely no need to there, there are so many podcasts out there that even if you had all the time in the world to dedicate to podcasts you wouldn't get through anywhere near the amount of content and uh, a while ago i said to my wife i go hey you know what you know what there's one thing that you should never start right now she goes what's that i go a podcast and she said to me she goes ah oh, yeah but but imagine if everyone who wrote a book had that idea like there's a lot of books published each year. Books haven't gone out of fashion just because there's a lot of them out there. I thought, you know what? That's actually, that was an incentive I didn't need because what had happened was for for about six weeks, for about six weeks, I'd been back down the little back studio of my house recording these podcasts. And, and my wife said to me, she goes, it's Jessie. I'm just going to refer to her as Jessie from now on. Jessie said to me, she goes, babe, what, what are you doing? Like what's the, what's the idea with these podcasts that you're putting together? I said, no, no, babe, hey, this is purely for me. It's purely for my own ears, my own entertainment. This is just something so I can listen back each year, sort of uh, vocalize my thoughts, try and get my head around ideas that are making me curious or interested or whatever. Um, no one else is ever going to hear it. And she goes, look, babe, we've, we've been together now for, for 13 years, and I can tell you with 100% certainty that the idea that this is not going to go public to anyone but your own ears is, is you completely tricking yourself because... There is a hundred percent certainty that within the next four weeks this will be live because you can't help yourself. And I said, "Babe, you obviously don't know me that well, because um, that's not what I'm going to do. This is purely for me." She goes, "No, honestly, I reckon you've got an ego that's big enough to think. Oh no, people deserve to hear this." I said, "Babe, honestly, I reckon potentially we need to we need to have a chat to a counselor or something because after all these years together, you clearly you clearly just don't know me." And then that conversation left my mind. I completely forgot about that, the fact that that happened. My wife came into the studio the other day and I was creating a podcast cover. And she goes, what are you, what are you, what are you doing? I said, but I'm just creating a podcast cover. She goes, what, for your own enjoyment? I said, no, actually, babe, what I'm thinking is I'm, I'm, I'm thinking I might even uh, release these to the public because I, I reckon people, maybe they'll enjoy it. And she had this look on her face that was like, you're so predictable. I can't. I can't believe you didn't take me seriously when I told you you were going to do this. And that's when it clicked, and I realised that I need to listen to her more. But also that everything she said is true. So I'm not sure if it's good news that this is coming to your ears or not. But but here we are. So that's a that's a little bit about what I'm trying to create. I'm trying to create a space for selfish reasons for me to put my ideas together. Um, if you find it funny, offensive, whatever, I'm sorry. Thank you. Good. Uh, take the response that is required for your particular perception on what's going on here. But but that's what we're going to do. So I reckon once a week is heaps. Any more than that, yeah. I don't know. If you really like it, I'll do two a week, okay? <laughs> if I'm going to change my mind based on how much you enjoy this. If I'm the only person listening after six months, there's a good chance this podcast ends. Um, but if I'm looking at download numbers and it goes, hey, like these numbers say people might like it, oh, all right, two or three podcasts a week. I think that's perfect. There's so many good podcasts though, isn't there? There's so many interesting people in the world that even if you're interviewing the same people as what other people are interviewing, listen, I listen I've listened to so many Jordan Peterson podcasts over the last three years. And yesterday I listened to an episode of him and Tim Tim Dillon. And I was like, this is this is such a unique perspective on Jordan Peterson. Because the the ideas or the questions that are getting thrown to him by Tim Dillon are just interesting. It's a new perspective. So I used to think, man, there's no way I'm doing any more podcasts. I'm not doing any more interviews. There's everyone who's been interviewed ever has already been on multiple platforms to do it. But then I thought, all right, this bloke's bringing a unique perspective, unique uh, sort of viewpoint to the conversation. Maybe it doesn't matter. So we'll find out. We'll find out anyway. And plus, we're in lockdown here in Melbourne still, which is which is a it's a pretty crazy place to be, really. I'm not sure if if you heard recently that. Um, like, depending on where you are in the world will depend on how surprised you are by that statement. Melbourne in Victoria is is we, compared to the rest of the world, we got we got next to no cases. It's an incredible it's an incredible success story about how few cases we have. Yet uh, we're we're very cautious. I've realised. I always thought Australians. I thought we were so. Uh, I thought we were passionate, like feisty people. That's the kind of international view that we try and paint of ourselves—that we're laid back, that we're that we're hard workers, that we're, we're like we're from convicts, we're, we're we're sort of criminals at heart. Do you know what I mean? And then the government says, "Hey guys, can you just go inside and sit down?" And all of us, all of us have gone, "Mm-hmm, 
tell me when we tell me when we can come out. And they go, you know what? Actually, you're not going to be earning money for quite some time. We go, you know what? You just let me know when it's safe for us to earn money, um, and then we'll come out. We'll just just in your own time, guys. Just keep keep doing really well. So I say that because. Uh, here we are, 18 months later after this whole whole uh, this COVID situation began, um, and we're st- we're still in lockdown. I'm in regional Victoria. The population of Queenscliff, which is the town that I live in, is about 12. It's it's not 12. It's a couple of thousand. Um, I don't think there's any cases of coronavirus within 100 k's of us. Maybe 30. I think there was a couple of cases in Geelong, which is just down the road, and people have started to panic. And as a result, here we are. We're. Uh, we're in lockdown central. So it's funny as well because I, I moved out to regional Victoria uh, getting close to a year ago now because we were living in Melbourne. And, okay, we just had our first kid. A little Charlie boy was born. He was sleeping in a hallway, which wasn't ideal for uh, my ego. Or, I don't know, just when you've got, got a six-month-old kid and he sleeps in the hallway of your house and you have visitors, it's uh, it's humbling do you know what I mean? Like your kid should at least have a should at least have a bedroom. We we're in a one bedroom apartment, and I said to Jessie, "I go, babe, we got to get out of here, don't we?" She goes, "Yeah, it's it's time. It's time that we leave." So we thought we were being clever, escaping Hawthorne, one bedroom apartment, coming down to the coast, getting the fresh air, enjoying the regional lack of restrictions, and uh, and we got here, and, uh, and 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 then there was a case within a hundred k's of us, and they said, "Actually, you know what? Stuff it. The whole of Victoria's locked down. No one's going anywhere." So it's been a it's been an interesting welcome to regional Victoria. We've got the water across the road from us though, which is nice. You know what I mean? You can still go out, get some fresh air. I much rather go out and walk walk through nature to get my exercise anyway. To walk through nature, clear my head, cast your eyes out past like a computer screen or the the really close walls that are around you in a city apartment, and I don't know something about that just feels relaxing. But I haven't lived in a, a in like a country town for such a long time that uh, I, I had this romanticized idea of exactly what it was going to be. So I, <laughs> I had this idea of, of like this, uh, when, when someone says country town, when someone says like a small community, I think of like this romanticized uh, 1950s or 60s small town in America where everyone goes past and gives each other a friendly wave and you know each other by name and you're encouraging everyone and the local cafe owner is excited to see you when you go in there for your cafe, uh, when, for your coffee. And you wouldn't believe, I, I never got I never got such a shock of what a small town was than when I got to Queenscliff. I, here's, here's a story. My my usual coffee order is, a, uh, is an oat milk flat white, preferably strong. You know what I mean? If they're, if they're feeling relaxed, if the people making the coffee seem pretty relaxed, I'll ask them to make it extra strong. I don't want to be that bloke who causes tension and frustration asking them to make it strong if they just want to make it normal, you know? But I went down to the local cafe here, Pasquini's it's called. It's I love it. I've got a soft spot for Pasquini's despite the story I'm about to tell you. I went down there with my wife. My wife said to the owner, Ned, his name is, great bloke, great bloke. She goes, Ned, I would like a, an oat milk flat white. And Ned said, we, we don't do oat milk. And we said, look, it's it's 2021. You can't you, you sort of you can't be not you can't be not doing oat milk. Obviously, being 2021, we're lactose intolerant. Uh, we want to make the order as frustrating for you as we possibly can. So if we could just grab a, a strong, small oat milk flat white, that'd be great. He goes, look. He goes, look, we I'm happy to make you an oat milk flat white, but here's the deal, you guys gotta bring me the oat milk because I'm not going to continue budging for, I'm not going to keep continuing to budge, you know, what milks I bring in based on the flavor of the month. I was like, man, well, Ned, technically, um, that's that's actually your job. You know, there's another cafe two doors up called Grow. They got beautiful oat milk. Would love to, <laughs> would love it if you could, if you could maybe just start ordering that in. And he, he refused. And I thought, man, that is, that is not, that, that's not the first conversation I thought I would have had in a country town. I, I always assumed that that order would have been welcomed with open arms. Now, I'm not sure if any of you guys are... Uh, bar- oh, is it barrister? Barista. It's a barista. I can't start calling people who make coffees a lawyer, but it's a, a mistake I often make. Baristas. If any of you are baristas, maybe you can appreciate Ned's situation here. But I think uh, being a cafe owner, having to pay rent... He's been used to having the only cafe in town. Do you know what I mean? He's He's been used to being the only cafe in town where you can get away with that kind of stuff. But, but is that... Am I being too harsh here? Like it's 2021. You should have you should have oat milk uh, ready to go. I don't know. 
Something I've been trying to navigate. For me, that was just a culture shock. I thought the rule of small community was you did whatever you could to help out your locals. <laughs> that could be the problem. Up here, you're not considered a local unless you're sort of born and raised here. So I've been here six months and have started turning up my nose at, at, at people from Melbourne who come up just for the weekend. I'm like, look at these flogs coming up to my town just to get like a little bit of a taste of the country. And uh, apparently I'm, I'm the flog. I'm pretty sure the fact that I just voiced what goes through my mind when uh, people from the place that I lived at just six months ago come to, I'm going to say my town, and I judge them so harshly shows that I, I could well be the flog in that situation. But I don't know. It, it, it really... It really distorted my view of, of, of what country town living was. I, I was of the impression that the fresh air in the country would make people more relaxed. I thought that I'd get up here, the stress of the city would disappear, I'd get out onto like a fresh sand trail, go for a wander, and, and everyone would just be up and about. But here, no joke, first week of being here, I was going for a walk uh, on a trail between Queenscliff and Point Lonsdale. It's like a 5K trail. Thought, beautiful, going to get to experience, get to explore the area. And I got on the trail, it was about to turn around the corner, and some bloke came around uh, uh, from from the corner just before I had a chance to turn. He goes, hey, mate, just before you just before you, you go around the corner, I just want to let you know that there's a, there's a lady I know just doing a little poo next to the path. I said, I said, mate, like, this is, this is why I left Melbourne, because this kind of stuff, it's just a... Uh, I thought it was the polluted air of the city, you know, that was that was allowing people to think this was acceptable. I said, mate, what, like, what, what is she doing a poo next to the path for? Have you got any idea? And this is what really shocked me because you can't say this in twenty twenty one. He goes, uh, he goes, mate, that's women for you. Am I right? And, and I, like, what do you say to that? It's I didn't, I didn't really know. I sort of like, of course, I smiled. I said, yeah, exactly, because I didn't want him to think that I disagreed with with what he was saying. I wanted to get on, on the right foot with him, but I told my wife when I got home that that's what I said, and she's like, oh my God, you went along with that? That's a, that's a horrible thing to say. Like, we've been married 13 years, and oh, we've been together 13 years, and I, I reckon that there's never been a time when my wife's done like a poo on the pavement. She she actually, she did a, she, that's not quite true. Like the fact She didn't do a poo on the pavement, but we were walking through, uh, so the Camino de Santiago is is like a, I, I want to say it's like a 600k. It's essentially as long as you make it. I, I met a lady from, she'd been walking for three months. She had walked from Germany to where we were in Spain. But we walked from from Spain to uh, Camino de Santiago. To Santiago is the place that we walked to. It was 300 kilometers over a couple of weeks. And there's a few days there where there wasn't a whole heap of toilets around, not a whole heap of people. And uh, there's actually a video on Instagram of this if you want to go check it out. My wife was like, babe, I'm, I'm busting. I, I can't wait till we get to the next town, which was about 12K away. I'm going to have to do a little wee next to the path. I said, babe, you do what you got to do. But, but what she didn't realize or what I didn't realize at the time was she was carrying a big backpack on her bag. And uh, as she squatted down, I immediately, my brain said, Tice, you know, if you just go and push her on the shoulder, she'll fall back. And she'll look like a little turtle stuck on her shell. And, and she won't be able to get up without your help. It'll be really funny. Um, and it was, I was, she squatted down. I could see that she automatically started to topple backwards. And I thought, Tice, you got to strike, man. You got to strike while the iron's hot. So I went over, I pushed her shoulder. She fell back. It was messy. It was graphic. I'm not going to lie to you. Um, it was, it was probably something I wish I didn't have to see. Honestly, she's a beautiful woman. And just to see, just to see I was gonna, that side, side to my wife, it's something that, you know, it, it's really imprinted in my mind. That was but that wasn't in a small. It was in a small town, but it wasn't in Australia. And it was on the. It was on the Camino. There was no other toilets around. That was the only other time uh, that my wife's ever done anything like that. So I think to generalise it as just like, a, hey, that's women for you. That's that's a little too broad, don't you think? I don't know. Maybe it is. Maybe it is women. If you're a woman, have you? Is that something that you're familiar with? Maybe maybe this is stuff. That, there's so much. I do. I've been married now, as I said, ten years, and there's still so much I'm finding out. Maybe this is something that you guys are known for. Maybe I'm the one who's been left out of the loop. Maybe I had no idea what's going on. If that's the case, I'm happy to be educated. But for me, that was just a couple. That was a couple too many shocks for for like the first couple of weeks here, um, where I live. It's a, uh, I don't know. Here's another thing that that's been a little bit of a shock for me. So this one's kind of this one's kind of embarrassing to talk to you about. But the 
It's true. So we came from a, a tiny little apartment in the city, right? It was... There was no room there. There was definitely no lawn. Of course, we were in Melbourne, so we had our green plants inside because we're all about, you know, um, like keeping to nature, sticking with nature. Do you know what I mean? Where the people, we live in a concrete jungle, but we just want to, like, our idea of exposing ourselves to nature is just having a small green shrub in the corner of your apartment, which is obviously what we had <laughs> because, because I do yoga and I just feel like that comes with the territory of doing something like yoga. So anyway, we come down to we come down to where we are now. We got our place, and we've got we're we're in a, a cool little cabin on like a massive block, which is awesome. That sounds like a humble brag. Maybe it is. I don't know. That's but our backyard is is monstrous, and that's been a part of. We want that for our, our kid. We've got a kid at the moment. We're planning on having a couple more. I keep eating my broccoli. Soon, Jesse, let me start practicing again. Maybe it's going to be more likely, you know, that we can have a kid in the next next couple of next couple of months it's a long it's a long turnaround between having your first kid and getting getting able to practice again though isn't it it's come as a shock to me i'm uh i'm both disappointed and surprised and yet slightly offended i don't know i feel like i'm in good shape i feel like i'm looking attractive i've got a good diet i'm ready to go but i don't know it's a harder sell than i'd anticipated (laughs) anyway my yard so we got to this yard and the real estate agent said to us, hey, uh, obviously, great place, but what you're going to need if you want to be comfortable here is a really good lawnmower. Have you got one? And I, one thing that I've always wanted to pride myself on or one thing that I've always wanted to improve is is I wanted to just tap into that, you know, that man part of me, that masculine part of me. And and to be honest, growing up with my mum, moving out when I was 18, I, uh, I probably didn't do that many manly things, that many physical things. And I thought, you know what? Mowing the lawns would be an awesome opportunity just to be able to tap into that that masculine manly energy that that I'm trying to create. You know what I mean? Like that you can drive past and go, hey, that guy, that guy probably knows how to, you know, restore a pipe. <laughs> I think the fact I just that was the example that I gave probably showed you that I've still got some work to do. But I didn't have a lawnmower. It was a lie. I just wanted this house, so I had to I had to tell the uh, the sneaky little lie just to make sure we got the place. But but within the first week, I thought, all right. I'm going to go get it. I'm going to go get a lawnmower. So I popped down to Bunnings, um, which is like our Home Depot here in Australia. And uh, actually, is that even what it is? Is Home Depot more like JB Hi-Fi? I'm not sure. Essentially, it's where you go to get all your manly needs. You know what I mean? Look, <laughs> that sounds sexual. Not your manly needs like that. I'm talking about just like lawnmowers and shovels, um, paint. You know what I mean? Like girls can do that too. I've, I'm Don't be offended that I've just used that as an example, but there's 90% men there and and like a couple of tough looking ladies. That's the, uh, what do you say? That's the audience. That's not the audience. You know the word that I'm trying to say. The demographic of Bunnings is that it's 90% men and 10% tough. Actually, 8% tough, 4% grandmas because they've got a nursery as well. My mum loves it there. You know what I mean? She's quite comfortable being there. But I went to the lawnmower section. There's 25 different lawnmowers. And I didn't know, I don't know what you're supposed to look for in a lawnmower. So I was having a look around. There was there was so many options that, but I didn't want to ask. I didn't want to look like the guy who didn't know what you needed in a lawnmower. So I, I just, I grabbed an electric lawnmower. Because to me, I thought, oh, well, electric is the future. Tesla, electric, Elon Musk would be stoked with this. Um, it also looked a little bit stylish, which I'm not sure is like a, a, a general thing that you need to look for in a lawnmower but it it was important to me you know what I mean (laughs) I wanted to make sure the lawnmower matched my jeans when I was mowing the lawns and uh, I got it home and I went to charge it up it was on the charger for about two hours and uh, and I went to so I unplugged it I thought two hours is surely plenty I I pressed the on button uh, but what I didn't realize when I bought it was yeah it's electric it's an electric lawnmower but it's electric in the sense that it has to be plugged in the whole time you use it (laughs) So if you unplug it at all, it doesn't work. And and our backyard and our front yard, which is the main problem I'll tell you about in a minute, it's they're massive. Like they're they're a really really long backyard. And this this lawnmower said it was good for like a townhouse. I was like, well, we live in a town. This is fine. This is going to be good. But it's not. So now. Now the thing I'm wrestling with is I I still need to mow the lawns. I've spent three hundred dollars on this lawnmower, and. Uh, and I have to do it with an extension cord plugged into the kitchen. <laughs> do you know? Do you know how humbling it is? Do you know how embarrassing it is to to be mowing your lawns in in front of a main road? Ballerine Highway is the road I live on. Um, a lot of tradies going past. A lot of a lot of real manly men looking uh, going past in their in their utes with their boats. 
and to be to be to be mowing the front lawn with an extension cord plugged into your uh, to your what is it? Not your sink. Into your kitchen. It, it's it's one of the most embarrassing moments of all time. So I'm stuck in that phase right now where we haven't. My my neighbours my neighbours got one. My neighbours got a, a lawn mower. I don't want to ask him to use it. I don't feel like I know him that well. This small town vibe's not as friendly as I anticipated. He'd probably say no anyway. I accidentally offended him the other day too, which would probably probably throw a spanner in the works for me. So we were we were out in the front yard having a chat, and he was explaining to me that he's found lockdown really tough and. Um, we were sort of vibing. It was one of those conversations where we're together, we were having a little laugh, and I felt like we are on the same wavelength. And I thought, I get this guy. I read him. Like, I felt like I just read him. Mark, his name is. And uh, Mark sort of, he was tapping his tummy as we were talking. And as he was tapping his tummy, I thought, gee, you know what? Mark's put on a bit of weight since I last saw him. And uh, as I had that thought, he said to me, he's like, man, I can't wait for this lockdown to finish here in Victoria because lockdown hasn't been good to me. And as he said that, he tapped his tummy. And, and so what would you interpret that as? He tapped his tummy and he said, lockdown hasn't been good to me. And obviously I just had the thought that Mark had put on weight and I wanted to just let him know that I recognized that, yeah, it hadn't been that good to him. So I laughed and I said, mate, I noticed you stacked on a couple of kgs. And uh, I don't know Mark that well. You know, this was a breakthrough conversation for us. And, and he stopped me and he said, he goes, no, no, Tice, I've, I've actually got a hernia in my stomach, which has been growing significantly through lockdown and I can't get it treated uh, just because the doctors that I need to see are, are, are not, act, not able to be accessed or whatever at the moment. And it was just that awkward, like my wife was standing there watching me with this smirk on her face like, oh, Tice, oh, mate, you just called your neighbor fat and he's, he's got a medical condition. I can see he's angry at you now. The atmosphere's tense. He looked a little frustrated. I felt embarrassed. How are you supposed to come back from that? Here I am. I'm walking around with my lawnmower with my extension cord plugged into the kitchen. I've just called my neighbor fat. I'm trying to look like a handyman. Clearly I'm not. I don't know. So that's that's why I can't ask him if I can borrow his lawnmower. It's, yeah, it's a predicament that I found myself in, I guess you could say. But uh, I haven't seen him since then. I took out his bins the other night to try and do him a favor. Um, he didn't come and say thank you, which he used to. So I don't know. Me and me and Mark could be on the rocks. It's. I think I'm going to go back to Bunnings anyway. I just I need to get a I need to get a proper lawn mower. I want to get a ride on one as well, just because uh, I feel like whenever you see someone in a ride on lawn mower, it screams that they know what they're doing. Anyone. My mum used to mow our backyard with with just a standard lawn mower, which was which was not that impressive. So for me, I, I'm used to seeing like a. A bloke, his name's Doug. He's got a beater on. He's uh, uh, he just looks tough. He's he's a little overweight, you know. But he, he looks like he's seen some stuff. He looks like a real man. His hands are calloused from uh, picking up rocks. <laughs> that's that's what I'm hoping to do. Anyway, that's uh, that that topic went on for too long, didn't it? It's just something I'm dealing with. One thing I have been doing over here, I've been trying to make the most of the ocean. So. Our, our our place is unreal. So we've got this got this place. There's uh, our place, and then there's a road. Then there's a little bit of bush, and then there's the ocean. And one thing I've been trying to do each morning because I listen to too much Wim Hof. Um, I also listen to so much of that Ricks and Gracie. Do you know that that Jiu Jitsu master? He's like a Bra- Brazilian Jiu Jitsu guy. He's on the Jocko Willing podcast a while ago. He's a tough guy, and he he just talks about the power of controlling your breath in uncomfortable situations, uncomfortable circumstances. And the example he always gives is controlling your breath in the cold. And I thought, well, that's what I want to do. So like the uh, my morning routine is to go over, I do my breathing exercises on the on the beach, which are quite intense. Do you know what I mean? I close my eyes and I really hyperventilate, trying to get myself psyched up, trying to get myself ready to go. I was down there a couple of weeks ago. The water was about 11 degrees. And I was just going to go in for two minutes. Do you know what I mean? If I could jump in for two minutes, I would have been stoked. It would have made me feel uh, super proud of myself. I would have been pumped. It's just a, it's a great way to start your day. I usually come back and look at the computer screen for a couple of hours. So to get out, just to extend your eyes over the water, see the horizon, see the birds, hear the noises. It's just a, it's a, a fresh way to start your day. So I went down there, had myself all hyped up, had my eyes closed. I was going for it maybe for about three minutes. Anyway, I opened my eyes and the local swimming group of, of women all in their speedos, they're about, I'd say the average age is maybe 55 to 60. Do you know what I mean? They didn't look like real tough women. They just look like, just what does a tough woman look like? I don't know. These guys, they just look regular. Do you know? They just got out of the water where I was sitting uh, after they'd swam 2Ks just in their, in their speedos. And they said, hey, what are you... <laughs> 
what are you doing? Obviously, I was the new kid at the beach. And I said, oh, I'm just trying to get myself all psyched up to jump into the water. Um, they go, oh, how long, how long are you going to swim for? I said, oh, no, no, I was just going to jump in for maybe like a minute or two just to see if I could do it. And, and have you ever experienced that real judgmental look amongst like elderly women where they, they make eye contact with each other? They, they think you can't tell. There's like a few smirks going on. I could tell they were disappointed slash judging. I got embarrassed about the fact that my, uh, my ability to withstand the cold apparently wasn't as impressive, uh, impressive as I'd anticipated. And, uh, and it was just there. There was just like a little bit of a tension, a little bit of a... Uh, the tension, to be honest, was completely on me. There was no tension on their behalf. They were they were quite relaxed. They'd just done their swim. They'd exposed themselves to the cold for what would have been maybe 45 minutes, which in 11-degree water, man, that's that's hard. Like, that's pretty tough. But um, I don't know. Now every time I see these mermaids, it makes me realize that's what they call themselves, the mermaids. That's the group. They, I'm not being patronizing when I say that. They, they genuinely call themselves the mermaids, you know? Um I don't know, I'm too embarrassed to go and do my breathing stuff down there in front of the mermaids now because I, I felt like I, le- I left Wim Hof down. I felt like I left the, let the mermaids down. I, to be honest, I, it's amazing how much it's amazing how much you can change your perspective on what's just taken place based on what someone else has done, isn't it? So anyway, I don't know. I just, I, I'm finding it hard to feel like a real tough man in, in Point Lonsdale, uh, Queenscliff, where I am at the moment because... Uh, <laughs> I got an extension cord to mow my lawns, lawns, and the uh, and the mermaids know that I can only do two minutes. Anyway, that's that's just where we're at. That's what we're working with. It's uh, because of COVID, the house prices down here as well have just they've just gone through the roof. Uh, I moved into the place that we're in right now, and we're paying about I think it's like four hundred bucks a week maybe. And as soon as we moved in, my my mate came around. He goes, "I actually saw this place up. That was it was three hundred bucks a week." just 12 months ago because of COVID, everyone sort of shifted out this way that the property like the house we're living in right now it's not if you saw it you'd be like oh like it's nothing fancy it's cool like i like it. it's it got that little beach vibe going on to it but um yeah i wish we had it got down here a little bit earlier would have been would have been nice my jokes aren't at a point see i've i've made i think the most i ever made doing comedy one night was 20 bucks for a gig <laughs> do you know what i mean it doesn't matter if you do one gig like that every night for 10 years you still don't have enough for a deposit on a house so uh so i've got a few other things in the work but look we're, we're renting down here at the moment hoping to maybe get our get our foot in the market but i think the average price down here is a little over a million so we've got some we've got some work to do do you know what i mean so if you're an event organizer and uh, and you're paying the millions for a gig. I'd be happy to come down and do one <laughs> because we got some work to do. I've been day trading the last six months as well, which is we're in a foundation stage there. I'm just trying to navigate the I'm trying to navigate the the stock markets, and I've been a little bit slow. But but even still, there a good day at the moment. It's not that impressive. So I'm gonna I'm just gonna have to cross my feet. I'm gonna have to pray that things start coming together because otherwise we are. To be fair, I'd probably live in a tent in this part of town. The problem is I've got a wife who wouldn't want to live in a tent. I just don't think it would be a great great thing for my son's confidence to live in a tent in front of his schoolmates in a town like this. So it's, uh, yeah, watch this space. We'll, we'll see how we go. But COVID's been funny like that, hasn't it? It's, it's amazing to see who's benefited from it. Like I think a lot of regional places have sold their houses for significantly more than what they would have been worth 12 months ago just because there's been such an influx of people out of the city i'm one of them remember one of those one of those flogs i was telling you about who's gone from the city out to regional to escape the lockdowns and um yeah i guess we don't know is it going to cool down is it not like is the price the price has been going up and up for like the last 30 years 40 years from what i've heard um, and it feels bad to want the housing market to crash just because i've got mates who have just purchased houses i've got mates who almost finished paying their houses um so you can't you can't pray that it crashes because you want them to be looked after as well but but for selfish reasons you know what i mean purely selfish reasons i hope it crashes and burns and then we can get a house for about 400 bucks in (laughs) in the ideal location that's not going to happen it's uh it's been a weird time through this this whole coronavirus period hasn't it it's are you guys sick of talking about it yet i i definitely am i feel like i've been coveted out i've I'm not a hundred percent sure what to do with the conversation because it's so it's such a tense it's such a tense conversation. It doesn't matter what side of the fence you sit on with it. It's uh it's like discussing religion a little bit. Like people are so adamant in their views, they're so convinced by 
by who they've listened to, myself included, you know, that it's it's hard to have a civilized conversation with anyone because before you know it, emotions get flaring. Um, people are talking about whether lockdowns are the best way to do it. Uh, people are talking about whether vaccines are the best thing to do. Um, you know, it's 18 months seems like a long time to be in lockdown. I've got a lot of mates who now don't have jobs. <laughs> I've got a lot of mates who, who I'm laughing at that just because, not because I'm happy that they've lost a job. I'm laughing at what I was about to say. I've got, I've got mates who for their whole life, they've run successful businesses, uh, they've abided by the law, they've done the right thing, and then all of a sudden, the rug was pulled out from under their feet, uh, they're no longer allowed to work, they're still paying for gym memberships, or, or in this, this, like some particular case, they're still playing for, paying for gym rentals, and they've just apparently got to be cool about that. If you argue it, you're, you're like an anti-vaxxer. You're like, no, no, I'm just trying to feed my family. They're like, shut up, this is for the greater good. You know, if you want to be able to look after humanity, you've you just got to suck it up. And this is what I've realized. It's so strange in Victoria at the moment because everyone that I see, with the exception of two of my mates, everyone who's in lockdown as a, as a teacher or everyone who's in a lockdown as a government worker, they love it because unless they've got kids at home that they're trying to... Uh, you know, figure out how to do the homeschooling with as well as the lockdown. That's a different story. Obviously, that that throws another spanner in the works. But most people I talk to, when you have a genuine conversation with them, they go, yeah, all right, well, I'm sleeping in a little bit longer. I haven't got the commute to work. Um, yeah, sure, Zoom's a little bit annoying to run my classes on. That's what my teacher mates are saying. But, uh, but there's a whole heap more time during the day to do what you want to do. Like, why? I completely understand. These people would be crazy to say in lockdown. They'd be crazy to say in lockdown because they're living their best life. It's I feel like lockdown is a little bit of a chance. If you're still being paid, you're sleeping in a little bit longer, you've got more time to do what you want to do with your day uh, in and around work, you haven't got someone breathing down your back to... Is that, is that, is that a breathing down your neck? Breathing down your neck to say, hey, you've got to get this work done, but this time... Man, you're living your best life. Why would you want to go back and do anything else? But then you got the other side of that who the people who are getting paid to be in lockdown don't understand where people are going, uh, I, I can't feed my family anymore. I'm on the dole, but it doesn't come anywhere near close enough to being able to support me and my family. Is there anything I can do? And then the thing that trips, trips me out a little bit, like the thing that I've found the hardest to navigate is my whole life I've been I've been helping people with their health, with their fitness. Um, running's my background. I'm really into health and fitness, nutrition, uh, just doing little things in my life well to, to make a real difference to the way I feel. And uh, and I'm super cautious which is uh, uh, with what I consume. Do you know what I mean? So naturally with a new vaccine, I'm going, oh, you know, I'm happy just to sit back for a little while, see what happens here. Um, maybe just learn a little bit more about it, find out. Because it keeps changing as well. Like we keep getting pumped with these booster shots now apparently. I, I don't know. So... But to say that you're classed as an anti-vaxxer, I've had so many vaccines in my life, it'd be impossible for me to be an anti-vaxxer. Do you know what I mean? Unless this COVID vaccine is the only one that counts to you being a, an anti-vaxxer in the world. Um, <laughs> I, I can't be an anti-vaxxer. But the reason I bring this topic up is because it has blown my mind how many people who who would probably cut class themselves before today as like relatively unhealthy, maybe overweight, smokers, not paying attention to you know alcohol consumption or diet, nutrition in any way. They're not getting regular exercise. It's amazing how many of these people are now telling me that I need to consider my health. Do you know what I mean? I find that so frustrating that, that just because you ask a question about a vaccine, all of a sudden it means you don't care about your health anymore. You've got these people who are 80 kilos overweight telling you how you should be doing it. Oh, man, it's just frustrating. It's frustrating to, I don't know. Is it one of those things that it, I think because there's so much like public noise around you should get the vaccine, which is fine. I genuinely don't have an issue with it. My mum's got it. Some of my best friends have got it. Uh, like I've got no issue with it. Just for me, I'm just taking it. I'm pretty, I back my immune system a little bit. I could eat these words real, real quick and change my tone really quick, but I'm willing to do that. Yeah. I'm a, uh, yeah, maybe in 12 months time, if I, if I get sick, I go, you know what? I was wrong. I was wrong about the vaccine. But it's just a, it's such a tense subject, isn't it? It's like the new religion. There's, I grew up in, in church. I started going to church when I was about 19 years old. And the one thing that frustrated me about the church was there were so many cool units out there who, 
they were just pretty happy to live their life and share their message with who who was interested in and and then all of a sudden you'd get these people who regardless of whether you were interested in what they had to say or not they'll just start shoving religion down your neck these are my views if you want to if you want to live after you die then this is what you got to do this is how salvation is reached blah blah and, and it was just unattractive it was just so unattractive and now i look at this covid thing and it just to me it just seems like there's a there's a massive correlation between religion and this it's like the new religion i heard i think it was jordan peterson yesterday he he put it well he goes uh for where mainstream religion or for where like old school religion i should say has disappeared there's these new secular religions that are starting to step up and i'm trying to figure out where i stand with all of this and what i'm allowed to ask about and what i'm allowed to question and if you question the wrong stuff it's like no no this is the dogma that you got to follow so it's been it's been interesting. And the thing, if you're listening from overseas, one of the things that's been funny here, just Google Australian health experts giving advice on coronavirus. <laughs> this is this has been one of the, the hardest things to watch because it's like, all right, I genuinely want to learn about what I should be doing. Like, I want to listen to the right people. I want to get the right advice. And I want to take the right steps, not only for my health, but for the health of those around us. And then you see these Australian health ministers from all different all different parts of Australia. I think we had one from South Australia who who didn't really understand Australian rules football. It sounded like she had never been to a game. It sounded like she didn't really understand coronavirus, to be fair. So we had like a Victorian team going to play a South Australian team in South Australia. Now, to set the context, the South Australian team, they'd been pretty clean. I think South Australia had, had like minimal uh, COVID cases over there at this time. And no one else in the country was allowed to travel state to state, but obviously, because money talks, uh, the Australian football teams were allowed to travel from state to state. And uh, and Collingwood, Melbourne-based team, was flying over to South Australia. Dirty team in general, just to be fair. You probably shouldn't touch the ball, even if they've kicked it. But in this particular case, the, new, uh, the, the South Australian health minister said, here, um, just want to encourage anyone at this game if uh, if the ball comes into the audience uh, and it's been kicked by the Melbourne team, I would encourage you, just for COVID safety, do not touch this ball. Do not touch this ball. <laughs> and you go, hang on. Is So we're happy for 36 blokes to run around on a field, tackle each other, scream at each other, talk to each other. There's There's so many bodily fluids. Coming from the mouth, do you know what I mean? So many bodily fluids flying around there that if COVID's going to be exchanged on the field, I think it's going to happen there. Uh, and so to ignore that, to go, oh, you know what? Just don't touch the ball. It, it just drives me bonkers. And then, I don't know, like, I, I feel as though a lot of the time these people treat um, the general public, like these health experts treat the general public as though they're idiots, as though they they don't have the capacity to think for themselves because we watch these footballers run around on a field for, for two hours, a bit over two hours, tackling, doing all the things I was telling you about before. And then we watch them all go into their club rooms and put on a mask because they've got to be COVID safe. Does that make, is that normal to you? Because I bring this stuff up at the moment and people go, Tyce, I can't believe you're a conspiracy theorist. I'm like, no, no. I, I believe, like, I hundred percent believe that COVID's an issue. I can see the, I can see the effects. I can see the numbers, but I don't know. Wearing a mask after, after two hours of tackling and sweating and, uh, you know, I guess aggressive cuddling of other men. It just doesn't seem like the right approach to it. Anyway, I love, I love. Uh, it's been funny to watch all the more conservative people down here in Victoria who'd been banging on for months about Gladys, how great she's doing up in Sydney, keeping everything contained, keeping everything together. And then all of a sudden, some numbers break out up there, and all of a sudden, she's taken like this hard-ass dictator approach, like what they've taken in LA. Like, we're going lockdowns, you can't go outside, you're not allowed to talk to your friends, you can't catch up in public because COVID's the only... No, don't talk about suicide. I'm not interested in suicide numbers or mental health. That everything is COVID, all right? If it's not a COVID death, we don't care. Don't talk to me about bloody cardiovascular disease being the major killer in Australia and the United States at the moment. What we care about is COVID, all right? So if you die of anything else, I'm sorry, but if you die of COVID, let's put it all over every TV program and make everyone terrified. <laughs> that's been the thing that's fun. Have you guys noticed, like, I've written a couple of blogs in my time, and I make a few YouTube videos as well. Uh and I know how important a good title is. And if you can attack someone's emotion uh, in a title, all of a sudden, 
uh, you feel a little bit more incentivized to go and click on that. I, I heard in a podcast, Rich Roll's podcast, uh, about a year ago, that um, he had a neuroscientist on there, and apparently, human beings' most pleasurable frame of mind to be in. How's this? This is where we most enjoy spending our time. Is in a space of mild irritation, which is crazy to me because I would have just guessed it was happiness. But if if you're anything like me, I think I'm in a state of mild irritation right now. I'm about to change the subject. Sorry, I know you probably COVID it out. I'm, I'm sick of talking about it, and yet here we are. Um, mild irritation seems to get people's attention. So I wonder, I wonder how fearful we would be of COVID if like the mild irritation or the fearful news articles which are posted every day just just were turned down a little bit. Do you know, because we're only ever talking about the issues that we're seeing on mainstream media. No one's really talking. Even climate change isn't getting a fair run anymore. No one's talking about that. Remember back in the days when the biggest issue was just climate change? How hot or cold the temperature is? It's, uh, everyone's forgotten about it. I'd love to, just let's break it up a little bit. Even the Trump days. Jeez, bring back Trump just so we can have something fresh to talk about. I don't know. It's interesting. The Gladys, the, the chick I just mentioned from New South Wales, she's the premier she was funny the other day because obviously there's all these people who are protesting now because they don't have work, um, they can't support their families, pay their rents, like insert whatever other issues they have there. So they're going out and protesting because it's like, oh, right, I can't live like this. And Gladys, Gladys just just two days ago, or last week I think it was, she came out and she said, um, look, I'm more than happy. I'm more than happy for people to protest once lockdowns are done. <laughs> but, but for the time being, can you just stay locked up, please? I'm trying to get on top of this virus. We need two weeks to flatten the curve. We've been in lockdown now for six weeks and the numbers have skyrocketed. We get, we're in the right direction. <laughs> I don't know. I get the vibe that I, I feel as though it's exposing, like this COVID time is exposing like some massive thinking errors that are taking part in, in every single individual's mind. And I got this idea from a book called Coddling of the American Mind where I can't remember the author's name, but he was speaking about how... Um, how often, like nobody, uh, very rarely are we actually trained to use our mind effectively. So as a result, uh, I think it's cognitive behavior therapy is the psychology that he's referring to in this thing. But but as a result of us not uh, having any idea about how to control our thoughts or think effectively, um, we make all these, these massive thinking errors like predicting the future or saying all the things that we should be doing, or or black and white thinking, or catastrophizing, or emotional reasoning. Like there's all these things that we have the capacity to change in ourselves that um, can make a really complex situation very uh, or much more bearable, or a lot more bearable. But because not many of us know how to do it, we see a news article which strikes fear in us. And then like a, like pardon the pun, like a pandemic, we share that fear around with everybody else and they buy into this fear. And then all of a sudden you've got this massive big hot bubble of fear that everyone's buying into. And if you, if you question the fear or if you, uh, if you, if you bring comparisons to uh, this coronavirus to the flu, all of a sudden you're a, you're a conspiracy theory. I don't know. It's been one of the weirdest things that I've ever experienced. Been such a weird thing. And then you have these politicians that keep telling us, hey, we're all in this together. And then you hear that they get like a pay increase through the lockdowns and you've completely lost your job. You go, oh, are we really in this together? Because it feels as though you're having a different experience to me. I don't understand that world very well, but it's, uh, I'm glad the playgrounds have just reopened. All right, that's, that's all I wanted to say. I'm just glad the pl- playgrounds have reopened. There's so many arbitrary rules, isn't there? I don't know. I'm usually such a nice guy. Like I'm happy to go along with what leaders tell me in a lot of cases. And for whatever reason, this one's just rubbed me up the wrong way. I think it was when that lady said, don't touch the football and you have to wear your mask after a game. And then you hear about some mum who can't travel interstate uh, to be with their dying kid. You go, oh, have I missed? Please tell me I missed something. Please, please, have I missed anything? I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, yeah, we've covered some ground today from electric lawnmowers to that. Here we are. I um, One thing, I'm going to tell you this, then I've got to get out of here. One thing that I'm, I'm glad not to see where I'm living at the moment, which I, I started to see popping up around Melbourne, was, do you know those pedestrian crossings where, so you get to a pedestrian crossing, I guess these are universal. I think every, maybe maybe some places in India doesn't have it. But you know when you get to the pedestrian crossing and you've got like uh, the little green man, which means go, the little red man, which means stop. 
in Victoria now, or in Melbourne specifically, because everyone's walking around just looking at their phone, they're walking around scrolling. Do you know those people? Man, I get so fired up when someone nearly bumps into me when they're walking on their phone. I get my little hip and shoulder ready. I get all these aggressive things, and I just politely step out of the way. That felt like for a moment I was going to get irritated and, and show them who's boss. But in um in Melbourne, what they have now, so because so many people are, are just continually scrolling through their phones, they thought, well, we don't want people to have to actually look up to see if the traffic man is green or red. We don't have to want people to have to make that thought for themselves. What we'll do, we'll put uh, lights on the ground that correspond with whether it's safe to walk across the road or whether it's unsafe. So if they're looking down anyway, they can see the red or they can see the green and they know whether or not they're safe to cross. For me, I hate it when we encourage antisocial behavior. Do you know, there's all these signs at, at the football that says, hey, report antisocial behavior. I think one of the most antisocial forms of behavior at the moment is people walking along on their phone, just paying no attention to the people around them, bumping in, other people just dancing around. Do you know what I mean? And now we're encouraging this behavior by having these pedestrian crossings on the ground, which shows them that they're either safe or not safe to cross. So it's encouraging, it's almost incentivizing the problem, which is which is kind of frustrating. I've been doing some brainstorming the other day, and I want you guys to tell me if you've got a better solution. Solution. But here's what I've been thinking we could do to to stop these problems. Because apparently the reason that they've been implemented is because there's been an increase in uh, pedestrian and uh, and uh, vehicle incidences at pedestrian crossings like this, specifically due to people being on their phone. And uh, I thought, well, what we should do is is instead of having like red or green lights on the ground, what we should do is remove those red or green lights, right? So completely get rid of them, just like we used to, and then increase the traffic speed by 20 to 30 kilometers an hour at and around these intersections. Do you know what I mean? And then just wait five years. <laughs> just, just wait five years. The problem takes care of itself. It just... it. Uh, it eradicates the the people who are refusing. I don't know. That was harsh, wasn't it? That's a bit mean. Does that bother you though? Like, is that something that's annoying to you? The fact that there's these there's these lights that just allow you to to cross the road and I don't know. I just wish we didn't do that. It's maybe I'm a little old school. I think I'm stuck between like old school technology. I've got a Mac that I'm recording this on, which is which is kind of pretty new school. Do you know what I mean? Think different. I'm all about Steve Jobs, but but then. There's definitely a gap. Like my mum, for example, she would look at that and she'd go, this is ridiculous. We're encouraging that behavior. But then also she's sort of stuck in that middle territory because the other night I came home and she was holding my phone trying to talk to Siri and Siri wasn't responding to her and she was getting frustrated because she couldn't understand um, She couldn't understand why Siri was being so rude. She didn't realize that she was, she was sort of activated based on my particular voice. Do you know what I mean? My mum couldn't reach that, that particular octave or whatever it's called, that tone, that depth of voice, that real manly, masculine voice that I'm, I have. Do you know? I think that's what it was. So there's a gap. I don't know. Is this the way things are going to be in the future? It's going to be interesting to see. It's going to be interesting to see. Does every road just have these, um, these little pedestrian crossing things? I don't know. I, I need your feedback on that one. All right. I need your feedback. But I like my, I like my theory. I reckon if we just increase that, to increase that speed. Remove the lights, encourage that behavior. The problem naturally takes care of itself. Tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> Tell me I'm wrong. You can't. Anyway, before I go, I um, what else did I want to tell you? Oh, that's a thing I wanted to tell you quickly. So, so I told you I've been I've been doing comedy for three years, right? Which is which is pretty significant, I guess. Like I missed a big chunk of it through last year with with coronavirus but i've just i've just started taking the approach that i've been doing comedy for three years because i think about it i write i prepare even if i'm not performing in front of people i, I you know I'll, I'll chuck a few ideas down but uh i tell you i've never seen a group of people so different that seem to get along in most cases as what i have in the comedy scene there's a I'm not really a druggy guy. I say not really. I've, I'm not a druggy guy. I tried, I tried marijuana once in my life. It was for my 30th birthday. My wife bought me a joint. She felt like it was something I had to experience. I, I, I don't know if it was laced with something, but I started having hallucinations, which I'm pretty sure were too intense for, 
for what we were told was in this joint. But there was there was some serious hallucinations. It was I felt like I had a new appreciation for science, had a new appreciation for um, biology, chemistry. I remember sitting there. I was like, no, I, I feel like I appreciate science because I could see this like this colorful baby in my mind that was connected, and it was just all like different color cell structures or whatever. And I was like, what the, what the, I'm pretty sure, what I'm trying to say is I think that the joint was laced in acid. And and the reason I bring that up is because my crew up until about five years ago had been, had really, it had just been athletes. It had just been health and fitness people. And usually, even if you don't get along with someone's personality in the health and fitness scene, you know that at least at the very basis, at the very basic level, one thing you have in common is an appreciation for health and fitness. Whereas in comedy, you have people like the champ, who's who's one of my best mates, Shane the Champ Gordon, whose health, fitness, little stud, uh, biceps on biceps, he's a fitness trainer, looks good. I think he's a bit Sri Lankan, so he's got like a natural year-long tan. Doesn't matter how long I'm in the sun for, he always looks like he's got a better complexion. Uh, vitamin D levels are, are, are right up to scratch. I just go red and then back to pale. And then... The other end of that spectrum, you have like just full-blown alcoholics and drug drug addicts who turns out I I completely love as well. Like I love these guys. But um, it's weird just some of the conversations that I've been forced to have as a result of hanging out with these people. And you know when you're in a conversation with someone and, and you don't have that much in common with them and you ask them what they do for work and then they say something like say for example... You met someone, you're like, hey, what do you do for work? They're like, I'm a bus driver. Uh, you're like, oh, I don't really know where to go with that. Like, it's, it's cool. Like, it's, and you've got, to just, you've got to try and look a bit impressed. No offense to any bus drivers out there. It's just an example of someone that you meet that you're like, okay, I don't, I don't really know what to go with that. You know what I mean? It's not, I could fake the excitement that I have for a brain surgeon, but it's just not, it's just not there. And I feel like you can see that through me. You can, you can sort of get the vibe that the way I'm acting doesn't quite match what I'm saying. And, and I had a conversation with a chick who's turned out to be actually like a good mate of mine in the comedy scene. But the first night I ever met her, I was like, hey, so so what do you do? And so casually, she goes, oh, I'm an escort. And I was like, oh, what are you, <laughs> what are you escort? <laughs> do you know? I don't think I said that. I didn't say that. But the answer was, she, it's just her body. She's like, yeah, that's what I, that's what I do. And I've, I've never really been in a conversation like that with an escort before where I'm, I'm forced, I don't want her to feel uncomfortable, but also don't want to look like I don't understand how to relate to that kind of people. So I kind of I kind of just tipped her, hey, fantastic, yeah, it's an interesting scene, you know. Um, she's like, yeah, it's not very rewarding Rewarding sometimes. I was like, oh, what do you, yeah, like, you know, <laughs> where, do you, where are you supposed to go with that? What are you supposed to say? I met another girl and she said to me, this is, this is not, this is no joke. I met another girl. I said, oh, what do you do at the moment for work? And she goes, I actually just send nudes to an old guy uh, who looks after my monthly bill. And I go, oh, you what? <laughs> I thought she was going to say I'm a receptionist or something. And then she's so casually just talking about the fact she sends nudes to, to other people. And then you, you find yourself in, in these weird conversations with people about, oh, so what are you doing on the weekend? They're like, oh, man, I'm just... I was going to go up to the, to the mountains and, and I've got some acid. I'm like, wow, this is, there's a few dynamics going on as well. You know, the fact that I admit this shows that I don't fully understand that, that kind of scene. I'm, I'm, the fact that it even stands out to me shows that I'm not, I'm not cut from that cloth. And uh, you don't want to make yourself look like you don't know what you're talking about, do you? But then there's, there's clear moments in those conversations where it's very clear that you're you don't know. I was at I was at a stand up comedy thing a while ago, and people were doing ketamine. They were snorting ketamine off bar stools. I had no idea what ketamine was at the time. Like I knew it was a I knew it was a joke. I, I knew it was a joke. That's not a joke at all. I knew it was a drug. I knew it was I knew it was given to horses, but I didn't know I didn't know the enjoyment. Apparently, it's a horse tranquilizer. It's a horse tranquilizer. I had no idea that people would get so much joy out of a horse tranquilizer. I think. If you're using horse tranquilizers to nullify your pain, that's some serious pain that you're dealing with, isn't it? Some serious pain that you're dealing with. Anyway, <laughs> I've been talking for 59 minutes. I reckon that's enough out of me today. Did you enjoy it? If you're still here, you obviously enjoyed it, unless you just started and skipped straight to the end to see if I was really still talking at the end, then that's just kind of offensive, but... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be back here next week, all right? I'm going to listen back to this. I'm going to figure out, 
you know, whether I should be doing this each week. Maybe maybe this is the first and last. You know what I mean? Leave me some feedback in uh in, in the Apple Store. Say hey, Ty's is either good or it's bad. Honestly, uh, compliments would go a long, long way. If you liked it, tell me. All right, because it's a uh, yeah, definitely vulnerable. And my wife's just got home, so I've got to let you go. All right, hey, have a good rest of your day. Big love. See you next week.